Royal Highness Sunam Jayan Vangshu, the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Bhutan, Dean of the JSW School of Law, His Excellency the Ambassador of India for Bhutan, Judges of the Supreme Court, High Courts, High Court and the District Judiciary, Members of Parliament and distinguished guests. First and foremost, Mr. Zankola. It is my pleasure to be speaking this evening at the Distinguished Leaders Forum organized by the JSW School of Law. I commend the industry and endeavor of the JSW Law Research Center led by the vision and compassion of Her Royal Highness. During my interactions with and about bright young minds of JSW yesterday in the course of the convocation, I could not help but appreciate the academic rigor of the institution. Justice, service, and wisdom. The motto of the ceremony was a rather unique and symbolic send-off to the outgoing batch of students. Alongside the graduating class, it is something that I believe will stay with me for a long time as well. Taking cue from the service-driven motto of the law school, I would like to address this August gathering of distinguished thought leaders on the subject of judicial legitimacy through accessibility, transparency, and technology dwelling on the Indian experience. Even the modern history of our nations goes back in time. In this remarkable shared history, we have witnessed several landmarks in India and Bhutan, social, cultural, and most importantly, legal and constitutional. As members of the same Himalayan family, we are uniquely different in our experiences, but also uniquely rooted in our respective cultural underpinnings. While the framing of the Indian constitution was informed by our colonial experience, Bhutan's constitution ushered in the 21st century with a royal decree. Yet both constitutions bear imprints of our cultures as we have adopted modern principles of democratic governance. Another common underpinning of both our legal systems is the primacy of the people's interest in institutional decision making. His Majesty King Jigme Sege Vanchuk declared in 2001 that the destiny of the nation lies in the hands of the people. Similarly in India, in the course of constitution making, we debated on the idea of including God or the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi's name, in the preamble to our constitution. And there was a discussion on whether the constitution should be given to the people of the country in their name, either the name of God or the name of Mahatma Gandhiji. But we finally settled on we the people of India as the source of constitutional authority, much like the Bhutanese constitution, the preamble to the Bhutan constitution. Both India and Bhutan face the unique challenge of harmonizing modern democratic principles, such as the separation of powers, judicial review, and a bicameral legislature with the traditions of our rich cultures. This was by no means an easy, an easy accommodation. I came across an interesting fictional depiction of this conundrum in the 1999 non-fiction story called Pretty Woman. This story by Dasho Kende Dorji is a story of a young village boy who is disillusioned by the introduction of modern amenities, such as televisions, in his quiet village life. Its author believed that it was the story of Bhutan standing at the cusp of modern transition, 
while seeking to preserve its cultural essence. Yet both our countries have struck a fine balance between the modern and the traditional. Now, first and foremost, we need to ask ourselves as judges, as people given to the law, why does public trust matter? What's the big deal about public trust that we are speaking about it today in the course of my lecture? Let me preface, therefore, our dialogue today with a preliminary inquiry. What is public trust? And why do we, as constitutional functionaries, and particularly judicial bodies, needed. Our constitution recognize that people are the axis of our salutary constitutional goals. We understand that as constitutional functionaries, parliamentarians, judges and governments hold constitutional authority only as representatives and trustees of our people. This is the essence of the public trust doctrine. The position of the judicial wing of the government is peculiar for two reasons. First, courts do not directly hold resources as trustees of the people. The resources of a nation are to be handled by the state acting in trust for the people. There should be an equitable distribution of the resources, tangible resources such as the natural resources, or intangible resources, such as opportunities, entitlements, and social security. As public functionaries, we are vested with the responsibility to give effect to this equity. Judicial bodies of the country are not directly in charge of the manner in which the resources are distributed in our society. However, it does fall upon us to adjudicate the fairness of that distribution, should it be questioned in our court. For instance, the Indian Constitution provides a broad framework of equality, which includes equality of opportunity in matters of public employment. The Indian Supreme Court has on numerous occasions tested the validity of affirmative action policies, what we call as reservations, in education, in public employment, in elected offices to the legislatures against the touchstone of this constitutional right. We have on several occasions questioned the distribution of fairness of state largesse, such as contracts and natural resources by the other wings of government. Because when natural resources are limited, and there is a distribution of natural resources by the state Disputes come up before the court where we decide on the legitimacy or the equity of the distribution of natural resources. Secondly, judicial institutions are peculiar in another way. We are not elected representatives of the people. Public trust applies to us differently from other wings of the government. The doctrine of public trust is linked with accountability. Now, the reason judges are peculiarly placed in the context of public trust is simply this. Accountability is typically associated with the elected representatives of the people in democratic theory. Elected representatives are directly accountable to their constituents and to the legislative institutions to which they are elected. By and large, they are voted in by popular mandates and continue in office subject to the people's enduring confidence in them. Courts and judges, on the other hand, derive their powers from the mandate of the Constitution or from statutory law. While the Constitution and these statutes are enacted in the name of the people, people directly do not have a role to play in the appointment of judges or in influencing judicial decisions. Rather, judges are supposed to act in a manner that is unencumbered by popular morality when deciding constitutional or legal questions. Even at the level of the trial courts, judges are trained to apply the letter and the spirit of the law with clinical detachment from the popularity of their decisions. Thus, in that sense, 
neither the appointment nor the continuity of judges is determined by the popular mandate enjoyed by their decisions. In fact, populist decision making sits rather uncomfortably on the sinewy shoulders of judicial independence. That is the hallmark distinction between judges on the one hand, the parliamentarians who are elected by a popular mandate, and the governments of the day who owe their accountability to parliament and therefore to the people at large. Yet, the courts of the country do require public trust and legitimacy. Institutional trust in the constitution and other courts of the country is the very basis of a thriving constitutional order. Public trust is central to the credibility of the judicial branch, which is otherwise insulated from public opinion in its operations, as it must be. As judges, we have to be insulated to retain our independence. But equally, just as we are insulated from the popular opinions of the day, we must have our bearings in public trust and confidence. Our insulation from public opinion, which is intrinsic to our independence, provides a crucial need and justification for ensuring public trust in our functioning. But away from constitutional theory and in simple terms, the reason for public trust is simply this. We deal with the problems confirming the daily life of our citizens. Having that trust is hence crucial to our work. To discharge that trust, we must place our feet in the shoes of our citizens who come to us, understand their lived realities, and find solutions within the universe of existence of our citizens. The Indian Supreme Court prides itself in being the people's court. This honor was not an automatic incident of independence from colonial rule or the enactment of the Constitution. Rather, we have striven to fit that description and shed the image of an imposing and alienating foreign institution. Emerging from the throes of colonial structures and legal processes that we inherited, courts in India were not immediately free from the colonial baggage in terms of public perception. Though the Indian constitution ushered in a new era of independence and sovereign institutions, this transition did not immediately reflect in our legal procedures and practices. Indian judges of the pre-independence British courts overnight became judges of independent India's high courts. Various processes in our modern courts, even today, resemble pre-independence procedures, except that we do not summon witnesses either on horseback or on camelback. Upon independence, even though people were now legally endowed with a host of entitlements under the new constitution, the felt effect of this supposedly tectonic legal shift was barely perceptible on the ground. As the apex court of the country, the Indian Supreme Court has consistently striven towards becoming the people's court. Substantively, the Supreme Court famously diluted the locus standi requirement, who can move the court, and opened itself up with as little procedural formality as a letter. And you'll be surprised of the number of letters which we receive as the Chief Justice of India I received year on year hundreds if not thousands of letters from citizens crying for being treated as petitions before the court. Just recently, I'll give you one example. Just recently, a letter was written to me by a young woman judicial officer who was terminated from service with other young women in the state of Madhya Pradesh for failing to meet the disposal norms during probation. All judges have disposal norms. And these young judges did not meet the disposal norms. They were terminated on their probation. So when I received the letter, we took so motor notice under the watchful eye of the court, and several of these young women judges came to be reinstated in service. 
The public interest litigation has thus become a unique part of India's constitutional order, which was co-opted by several other jurisdictions across the world. The Supreme Court, for context, besides acting as a final court of appeal, exercises discretionary power to admit special leaves to appeal under Article 136 of our Constitution. Studies have demonstrated that we afforded preferential treatment to the relatively weaker sections of our society or the less powerful parties in exercising this discretion. Substantive outcomes are only a part of the accountability of our courts. The substantive outcomes of cases we decide are important in themselves, but they are only a part of generating public trust. Judicial institutions are assessed by the people based on substantive metrics such as the consistency of the outcomes and adherence to constitutional values of equity, fairness and justice. But there is more to institutional trust. In an interview about judicial responses to public perception, a former chief justice of the U.S. Court of Appeals, Diane Wood, remarked that it is important where people get to know about the courts. Where do they get to know about the courts? She said that we tend to think of courts in terms of theories of interpretation and scholarly articles in journals on the law. But that is not how people at large perceive the courts. People at large don't look at the courts from scholarly articles or from journals in the law books. She believes that in the context of the US Supreme Court, where judges are confirmed in a more political environment, confirmation processes is how people learn about the Supreme Court. But it's very different in the global south, in countries like India and Bhutan. In India and countries where judges and judicial institutions are largely removed from the public eye, people learn about the institutional structures and systems of the courts when people interact before them. A traditional Tibetan proverb goes, and I'll quote the traditional Tibetan proverb, what is written in ink can fade away by a single drop of water. What is written on the heart will last an eternity. Similarly, how people perceive our courts when they interact with them is nearly indelible. At any given point of time, the number of people before courts at various stages of the proceedings easily exceeds the number of people who reach final merit-based decisions in their disputes, and more so in countries like India, where the volume of litigation is so large. Those in the queue waiting for justice exceed those who have reached the end of their journey in the court. It is therefore public trust which blossoms in these everyday interactions with our courts. Not the culmination of the journey alone, but every single step of this journey is an opportunity to foster public trust and gain legitimacy for our institutions. Not only judicial decisions, but also the roads leading up to our decisions must be transparent, navigable by every citizen, with or without a legal education, and must be broad enough to accommodate everyone. Indian courts operate in a three-tiered structure. The trial courts led by the sessions or the district judiciary are the courts of the first instance. The high courts in every state discharge original as well as appellate functions, and at the apex, the Supreme Court is the court of last resort. Like in Bhutan, the High Court and the Supreme Court are constitutional courts. The Supreme Court is also constitutionally vested with plenary powers under Article 142 to do complete justice in matters of legislative silence. Sometimes the best of parliamentarians, either deliberately or by simple omission, leave silences in the law. And how is the law to be interpreted when there are silences in what Parliament has ordained. So we have the power under Article 142 of the Constitution to do complete justice to the facts of a case. Recently, 
we used our constitutional power under Article 142 to bring justice to a young Dalit student. The father of this student is a daily wage earner, and the student was late by a few minutes in putting together the fee of Rs. 17,500 for admission to the Indian Institute of Technology at Dhanbad. Before he came to the Supreme Court, he first knocked on the doors of the legal service institution in Jharkhand, where he resided and where he belonged. But he was directed to the High Court of Madras because the entrance examination was being conducted by the IIT at Madras. So this young boy went to IIT Madras and thereafter to the High Court of Madras and having failed everywhere, came to the Supreme Court. We felt that the constitutional power under Article 142 to do complete justice had to be exercised here and we directed the grant of admission. Small case, not a case which decides huge constitutional issues. But the reason why I mentioned this recent example, which is fresh, so to speak, from the judicial oven of last week, is for the simple reason that it is in the seemingly small cases which come up before us that we either generate or destroy public trust. You ask me, I could have conjured up 10 reasons to tell this young student why we couldn't entertain his grievance. Reason number one, the term at IIT Dhanbad had begun in June and he had come to us by the end of September. Two, he had not uploaded all his data on the online portal by 5 p.m. on that given day, and the law is equal for everybody. Three, though he had gained admission to one of the most premier institutions in the country, yet he was too late in getting admission. But I dare say, I, 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 the reason I refer to this is that just as we can find as judges, as lawyers, 10 different technical reasons to deny justice to a citizen, to my mind, one good reason to grant justice is what really sustains public trust in the work which we do. Institutional trust is determined by the experience of individuals. The language of the law and courts, distance between the litigants and the courts, and familiarity or the lack of familiarity of court processes are important determinants of the accessibility of our courts to the people. Linguistic differences physical inaccessibility and complex procedures often exercise an alienating influence on the people and erode public trust. In India, the predominant language of the higher courts is English. That's not the language of the people. In a country which is a witness to geographically mountainous reasons like Bhutan, the physical distance between the court and the people is another reason for inaccessibility. Notionally, the litigant is at the center of the litigation. Why do we exist? We exist for the litigant. So the litigant is the center of litigation. But actually, more often than not, the litigants are forced to rely exclusively on the assistance of their counsel, the assistance of their lawyers, to make sense of what goes on in our courts. Physical access to even the courts of the first instance is an expensive affair on account of distance and poor connectivity by public transport. And as societies become more and more complex and sophisticated, the cost of litigation only goes higher and higher. I'd hate to be a litigant in a court if I had to spend my own money to engage a lawyer. Those who can sometimes even expend on even exhaust significant monetary resources while still at the courts of first instance. The Supreme Court Research, the Center for Research and Planning of our court, has documented in great detail some of the issues facing the physical infrastructure of our courts. Using a technology-based platform, we have now decided and we are tracking the deficiencies in court infrastructure. The Indian Constitution recognizes the right to move the Supreme Court of India directly in case a fundamental right is abridged. Legally, this was a huge leap from colonial times where the highest court for resolving disputes, the Privy Council, was far removed from the territory of our country and located in London. 
but on the ground, the change after independence would have meant very little to a litigant sitting in a remote corner of the country, far removed from Delhi, the seat of the Supreme Court. I always say that we have the Supreme Court as the Supreme Court of India. It's not a Supreme Court of Delhi. It's a court which is representative of the entire nation. And how do we make our courts, the Supreme Court of Bhutan, the High Court of Bhutan, the Supreme Court of India, truly representative of the entire nation? And let me briefly now deal with the Indian experience on accessibility and transparency through the use of technology. First, the process. India has been using technology to counter some of these barriers to accessibility. Our e courts project began in 2007 as a countrywide initiative to improve judicial efficiency and justice delivery. We now have the facility of filing cases at the click of a button through our e filing platform. We have been witnessing a marked decline in physical filings, and more and more citizens are now taking recourse to the 24-7 20, facility of filing through e-filing of cases. Once the entry threshold is crossed, institutional responsibility entails that a litigant must be made aware of the progress in their case. You know, there is a digital divide both in Bhutan and India. Despite the march of technology in India, we can't deny the fact that there is a digital divide a divide between people who have all the electronic resources and people who do not. How do we bridge this digital divide in our countries? Our case management system, which is developed on a free and open source software, is the largest case management system in the world. The reason why we developed our technology on a free and open source software is because we thought that if we go into a proprietary software, we'd be married to a particular corporate entity for the rest of our e courts project. Our free software has not only helped us costs significantly, but facilitated effective communication with the litigants. The Supreme Court now also sends WhatsApp updates to advocates on record and parties in person. So we have not put the burden of accessing information on citizens. The colonial model put the burden on citizens. Judges sat in these exalted courtrooms with huge silver maces before them. And they put the awe and fear of God in common citizens. That, that paradigm has to change. That's what technology has helped us to change. We have now taken upon ourselves as judicial institutions the burden of communicating information to citizens, not placing the burden on citizens to access information. The case management software sends automated emails to litigants with case details, hearing dates, judgments, and orders. We also have offline e kiosks in courts across the country that assist litigants navigate the system with greater ease. We have about 18,000 courts in India, within 3,000 court establishments. And in every court establishment, we have established what we call e-seva kendras, which simply put, means that these are e-safe, e-service centers where all the services of the electronic mode of justice delivery are available to a citizen in the physical space of the court. So just as electronic technology is virtual in all respects, we also provide a physical space where a citizen who does not have access to electronic resources can yet access justice. Hybrid hearings that were introduced in order to tackle the COVID-19 induced nationwide lockdowns are now a feature of our courts. Virtual courts and video conferencing have helped us overcome the massive geographical limitation faced by litigants from smaller and inaccessible pockets of the country. Also, persons with physical impairment, pregnant women, persons in their advanced years can now access the courtroom virtually. What this has done is to bring about a social transformation in access to justice. I find as a judge that more and more young women lawyers now participate in our court proceedings through online hearings. Women, as we know in our societies, perform multifold responsibilities. They are the primary caregivers, primary caregivers to the elderly in the family. 
They are the primary caregivers to children who are being brought up in the family. They are primary caregivers to in-laws, to societal institutions, because our societies have very strong cultural bonds. But the use of technology has enabled women to participate more and more in the workforce, particularly in the legal profession. Instead of falling out of the legal profession, when family responsibilities require them to spend more time at home. But as judges, we have to be sensitive to the peculiar needs which women litigants or women lawyers have to fulfill. I remember in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, when I was once conducting an online court hearing addressed by a woman lawyer, a little one-year-old child walked into the courtroom, the physical, not the physical courtroom, but the virtual courtroom, saying something mummy or something, you know, she wanted a little something. And the, and the young lawyer was so, she was so embarrassed that a little uh, one or two-year-old child had walked into the space of the courtroom. So I told her, I said, look, as judges, we are either grandparents, we are parents. We have little children within our families. So it's a matter of pride that a young woman is actually addressing us from the pressings of her home, consistent with her family. So there's a lot with which we as judges, as lawyers can do to make our system more accessible and transparent. I'm aware that Bhutan holds its traditional alternate dispute resolution methods such as mediation in deep regard. The Honorable Chief Justice shared, just shared with me a short while ago that guided by the vision of Her Royal Highness, almost 4,000 cases last year were transferred to the mediation platform of the, of the uh, Supreme Court. Back in India, we recently concluded the special National Lok Adalat Week at the Supreme Court in August, which was an extraordinary feat in terms of case volume and technological reach. The Lok Adalats, or the People's Courts, are essentially court-mediated settlement proceedings where parties are directed towards alternate dispute resolution mechanisms in appropriate cases. Commemorating 75 years of the Supreme Court, 13 benches of our court engaged with parties, the district legal services authorities, and counsel from across the country, and settled a record number of over a thousand cases in five working days. Motor accidents cases, check dishonor cases, Small cases of personal compensation were all resolved. The proceedings of important constitutional cases in the Supreme Court are live streamed by us on our YouTube channel, bringing constitutional deliberations to the homes and hearts of all citizens. The Supreme Court of India today is almost entirely paperless with digitized and optical character recognition OCR enabled paper books. But let me give you a small example amidst all the theory that we are talking about. In the course of the special national Lok Adalat, we had identified cases which were capable of resolution. And one afternoon, there was this woman who was joining us virtually from a remote corner of the country. And when the case was called out, uh, the woman said, Sir, I'm withdrawing my case. And I said, why is this woman situated in a remote part of India, telling me after a battle of over a decade that she's withdrawing the case. It would have been very easy for us to say, all right, case withdrawn, one less case in our 80,000 cases on the docket. But I opened the papers, and I found that this woman had filed a claim for compensation. Her brother used to sell steel utensils in homes. He was traveling in a train one night with a baggage of steel utensils on his back, he probably slipped from the train, fell, and died. His body was recovered three days later. All along the hierarchy, the woman who was fighting for compensation for the death of her brother was denied compensation. And why was she denied compensation? When the body was discovered, no ticket was found on the body of the victim. And in the absence of the ticket, the railway administration said, what is the proof that he was traveling by train? And there was this woman fighting this lone battle for 10 years through the hierarchy and telling us at the end of it 
I don't want to pursue this anymore. And it was very obvious to me as a human being that she was tired of the legal system. She was not withdrawing the case because justice has been done, but the sheer weight of time in pursuing the processes of the law showed us what injustice lay just in the delay in the court processes. Now, we couldn't settle the case in the course of the Lok Adalat because the collector, the young collector who was appearing before us, had no authority to agree to the claim for compensation because the Lok Adalats, as a mediation, are voluntary. So we said we'd keep the case the next Monday. So this was on Friday afternoon, and we placed the case the next Monday. And we said that the absence of a ticket on the dead body of somebody who is alleged to have traveled by train should not be a ground to deny relief. And we gave her full relief with interest and spoke to her on the video conferencing platform. She was not smiling because she was tired of the delays of the law. But it certainly brought a smile to our hearts that we had used a little bit of our judicial power to do justice to the There's an infamous, there's an infamous refrain which we will commonly hear in India, and that infamous refrain is that courts are places where there is tarik pe tarik, there is a date after date, which is a Hindi pejorative reference to multiple adjournments. Unfortunately, some of our cases have persisted in the system for years, if not decades, but we believe that acknowledgement is the first step towards reform. Suppression is the first step to prevent reform. Our National Judicial Data Grid and iJuris, a software, these are two information sharing platforms which indicate district-wise pendency in courts and vacancy and infrastructure needs of these courts have enabled us to put out our data in the public realm. The National Judicial Data Grid a repository of nationwide judicial data of about 3,000 district court establishments, the high courts, and the Supreme Court is now a click away for anyone and everyone. So after dealing with process, let me deal a bit with outcomes. Typically, at the end of the legal journey will lie an outcome of a case. It matters how the litigant has been treated all this while, as we discussed earlier. It is also equally important that the outcomes are communicated effectively and swiftly to those who have reposed their faith in the institution long enough to see the journey through. Our constitutional courts are courts of record, and their judgments carry precedential value. It is imperative that our decisions be communicated to not only those before the court, but to those who are not parties to the litigation, but may require this information for their own legal remedies, academic engagement with the judgments, or simply to assess their legal options. As I told you, we have the National Judicial Data Grid, which is a repository, it's a mine of data of millions of cases. And I thought, why shouldn't we use artificial intelligence to give citizens simple information about their legal rights? What if there's a woman who is facing domestic violence she doesn't know what to do. All that she knows is that when her husband, who is alcoholic, comes home every night, she's going to be assaulted. But she wants to know, what do I do? She can't go to a lawyer. She has no money or resources to go to a lawyer. So we thought that we should develop a chatbot, an AI-based chatbot, which we are now in the process of experimenting and implementing in the Supreme Court to give simple solutions in different languages to citizens who would ask us, my land has been acquired for a railway project. My land has been acquired for a hydroelectric project. What do I do? Can we not really use this mine of data which our courts are generating to communicate very, very simply what rights citizens have? It is imperative Therefore, that we communicate our decisions in language which our courts, which our citizens understand. Public trust, after all, includes the trust of those who are viewing the institution from the outside without directly interacting with it. Courts perform what we know as the shadow function. 
they create guidelines not only for the parties before them, but for the society at large. We believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant in our courts, and that correct and accessible information is an antidote to disinformation. We live in the electronic age where the social media is now governing our lives. But with the social media, we have so much of disinformation. The only answer to disinformation is to provide for more information and to provide for genuine information, to provide for more sunlight to come into the court. And therefore, I was delighted at the library of the JSW School of Law, which lets in so much of sunshine, so much of light into the library. It's symbolic that the more of light that you let in into our institutions, the more we'll be able to provide justice to our citizens. So the Supreme Court, we are using a software called SUVAS, the Supreme Court Vidik Anuvad software, a machine learning AI-enabled translation tool for our judgments to be translated into 16 regional languages recognized by our constitution. As of today, 73,963 decisions have been translated into Indian languages. All 37,000 decisions have been translated into Hindi. We are also live streaming and recording important constitutional cases available over our YouTube channel for public consumption. Easy access to the judgments of the Supreme Court of India is provided through the digital Supreme Court re reports, where thousands of our old judgments are available for free. It is ironical that we are the judges who deliver the judgments, but our judgments were being sold by private publishers. Now, they do a remarkable job about printing those judgments beautifully, headnoting them. But come to, come to think of it, which young lawyer can afford the cost of a private report? And in the absence of information, most of our district courts would function without knowledge of the Supreme Court judgments. Now, with the free digital Supreme Court reports, this is a completely free of cost service which is provided to law students, law researchers, any citizen across the country and the world. Similar to the SCR, the judiciary here in Bhutan is centralizing court records and data, which is a remarkable achievement. The JSW School of Law is joining forces to create an accessible, online, AI-based legal database which will contain all judgments in Zonka and English for public benefit and academic research. The eCourts project is similar to the e-litigation platform that courts here in Bhutan have been working with as one of the first countries to experiment with e-litigation during COVID-19. Bhutan has indeed led by example, not only in the global south, but across other parts of the world, COVID-19, push the frontiers of our court systems, which were compelled to change overnight. Courts became more than just opaque physical spaces. They have truly become open. Technology is not a one-stop panacea for all social inequalities. Complicated issues such as AI profiling and the consequent stigmatization of individuals in large language models, algorithmic, algorithmic bias, Misinformation, exposure of sensitive information, and the opacity of black box models in AI are crucial roadblocks which we must confront. But we must not shy away from tech-enabled measures that further judicial accountability. Judges of constitutional courts are answerable to people of the country. As the Bhutan Supreme Court noted, in opposition party versus the, Bhutan, the government of Bhutan, one of the foremost constitutional cases, the constitution is the guide that the court shall never abandon. Democracy is not just about numbers. Last evening, I had the privilege of meeting the Prime Minister of Bhutan. Two members of parliament, including the present Prime Minister of Bhutan, moved the Supreme Court to ensure constitutional legitimacy in the enactment of money bills, which led to the most significant judgment of February 24, 2011. This account is a reminder to the contemporary world 
that while popular majorities define who is in government, the task of ensuring democratic accountability is a wider constitutional project. The court had famously noted that the constitutionalism is entrenched in the democratic order of the country. Constitutionalism is, the, is based on the desirability to be governed by the rule of law rather than by arbitrary legal systems. Indian constitutionalism manifests itself in the wide-ranging powers of the Supreme Court. Described as one of the most powerful constitutional courts in the world, the Indian Supreme Court shoulders that much heavier an obligation towards the people of the country. Clause 11 of Article 1 of the Bhutan Constitution treats the Supreme Court here as the guardian and the final arbiter of this constitution. The Indian Supreme Court is similarly situated. As such, we are tasked with mediating the relationships between the state and the citizen and the relationship of citizens inter se between themselves. But foremost, we are responsible as apex courts of democratic countries to bolster public trust in the judiciaries of our countries. We then, in conclusion, circle back to our initial inquiry. Why does public trust matter in judicial bodies? Public trust is crucial <coughs> if our courts aspire to be viewed as effective, dispute-resolving and deliberative bodies. Public trust is not only about the court's legitimacy, that it is the court's moral right to command obedience or allegiance. Public trust is about the broader function of the courts as public-oriented institutions. We are institutions above all who are dedicated to public service. Institutional design, structures, including architectural structures, must therefore be geared towards responsiveness, transparency, and accessibility. Sunlight is not only the best disinfectant, it also begets public trust. It helps us keep our house in order. It serves as an internal check on the functioning of the courts across the country. It ensures that our institutions are better managed and use their resources effectively. Measures such as live streaming have helped foster internal efficiency, accountability, and institutional stability. This has also augmented certain positive changes in the form of better engagement with the judicial proceedings in courts, a sense of familiarity in a traditionally alienating court environment. I believe that the next generation of lawyers will be a force to reckon with, simply because the institutional insights at their disposal are immense. I believe the legal profession has tremendously changed from the times when lawyers in my generation started practicing. When we came to courts, we thought that we had to wear the band and the gown, the black coat, and go and start disputing between clients who came to us. The perception of the law has changed now. Lawyers are vital elements in social transformation, in peaceful settlement of disputes, not just generating disputes. We see more women, more first-generation lawyers, more members from minority communities joining the profession thanks to the decentralization of these resources. In several of our states in India, over 50% of the new recruits to the district judiciary are women. Yesterday at the JSW convocation, 17 out of a graduating class of 24 were women. That is a sign of change, of social transformation. Our societies are young. While we reap the demographic dividend, our institutions have to be calibrated to account for changing social realities. The need for public trust therefore becomes ever more important. The perceived fairness of our decisions, as well as the ease of obtaining them, are important. Justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. Outcomes are rarer than process-stuck people in our courts. Thus, not only the constitutional outcomes, but constitutional journeys matter equally. Open courts, accessible courts, are a crucial part of the mission. Technology and simpler processes will be key to these journeys. 
I would like to conclude my address by highlighting the rich and illustrious history of the India, India Bhutan legal traditions. The chairperson of the Bhutanese Constitution Drafting Committee, former Chief Justice Bjornko Sonam Tobge, underlined how Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, the foremost framer of the Indian Constitution, gave India a truly transformative constitution. Dr. Ambedkar speaks to the foresighted text and spirit of the Indian Constitution. And as Chief Justice Tobia had noted in 2014, his constitutional principles and germane values soared and traversed the oceans and the mountains of the globe. Bhutan was a grateful recipient of this wisdom. Mr. K.K. Venugopal, a senior advocate in India and former Attorney General for India, was the external constitutional advisor to Bhutan in the framing of the constitution. Over 90 years old now, Mr. Venugopal's experience of the law continues to guide our legal discourse in India. More often than not, and more often than his physical appearances, we see him in the hybrid hearings of the Supreme Court across the video conferencing screen. Technology has therefore the capacity to redefine the interface of courts with citizens in seen and unseen ways. In many ways, the constitution and legal journeys of Bhutan and India have intersected and continue to do so. A conversation between friends is what brings me here this evening. It is my sincere hope that our nations continue to bask in the glory of our truly unique constitutional orders and break new ground through continued cooperation. I extend my gratitude to the JSW Law Research Center, the government of Bhutan, the Indian ambassador to Bhutan, and above all, to Her Royal Highness for having me here in Bhutan and for organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you.